Thank you very, very much. <clears throat> I, um, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Koshu and um, Mr. Baba and everyone in the audience, I am much appreciative. Uh, and I'd like to deal with some broad challenges today um, in terms of um, dealing with both conservation and development. And so first one would be the problem that we face that social and ecological um, systems vary tremendously, as we've already started to talk about, uh, from one system to the next. Um, social systems also exhibit immense variety, uh, and they are complex. Uh, each SCS is unique, as each human is, and we we try to make them as if they were all the same rather than recognizing uh, how individual they are. Um, as social ecological systems are structured by multiple variables that affect patterns of um, outcomes over time, um, and we need to, need to develop our diagnostic skills. So I'm, I, at one point we'll be getting into some of our efforts to uh, look at those diagnostic skills carefully. Um, one of our problems, as, as Sherrod mentioned, is the disciplinary um, boundaries that we frequently have. Um, we, need, uh, we need to draw on disciplinary boundaries, but not only. We need to broaden our scope and understand what we can learn from other disciplines. And so what we've been doing of recent times is building a common framework um, that um, uh, could be uh, added to by uh, foresters, uh, water resource engineers, uh, fishery folks, etc., cetera, uh, to try to understand why do some social ecological systems perform very well while others fail. So I'm gonna talk about that framework today um, I'm going to go back to uh, studying uh, for a moment uh, a underlying um, uh, foundation. Uh, for about 30 years, we used the Institutional Analysis and Design Framework, IID, and uh, it gave us one of the ways we were able to go across laboratory and field research uh, and statistical analysis was having this. Um, now uh, working with colleagues all over the world to uh, expand that. Um, and we can think of that as kind of a beginning underlying core um, where we are thinking of rules and a variety of other exogenous variables that affect how actors uh, who are assigned to positions and have actions assigned to them uh, can be making decisions in light of information and control over those uh, that uh, lead to potential outcomes that affect uh, their net costs and benefits. Um, but now what we've been doing is working on a broader SES framework, uh, building on that um, uh, uh, effort. And here we could be thinking of a focal uh, social ecological system. That focal system could be a lake, it could be a river, it could be a groundwater basin, a fishery, a forest, or very big, the globe. And um, all of the focal uh, systems that we're interested in uh, look at four internal systems embedded in two external. So it's very important that we think through what's the structure of the resource system? What kind of resource units does it produce? What kind of governance system is there? What kind of actors are uh, directly involved? And then how do these interact in action situations uh, that lead to outcomes? Uh, and um, the many people say, well, what in the world are you doing? Uh, common framework, uh, you know, what do you get out of that? Uh, and um, so it isn't the answer. It is a mode of helping us diagnose problems, helps to identify variables that affect the structure of action situations, and that's where we get people who are trying to conserve versus those who are finding ways of getting material benefit. Um, and it helps us study similar systems 
that sh share some variables but differ in regard to others. Um, so uh, we've had a tradition uh, for the last 40 years of there being optimal solutions. And I'm hoping that people, as they are beginning to uh, develop a better diagnostic tool, get away from uh, the presumption that all resources should be privately organized and in the market, or all resources uh, should be uh, government owned or um, uh, whatever. And uh, that's one approach, private versus government. And then others come along and say, but my resource is different than yours and won't allow any generalization. And so we're trapped if we go to either of these two extremes. Very important not to, but we need a framework to get us uh, uh, away from that. Could you? Hang on, let me get the water. <clears throat> to second tier variables. Um, and uh, we brought, identified for a resource system a variety of important uh, second tier variables. Um, <clears throat> and the same, <clears throat> pardon me, and the same for actors and the same for resource uh, systems and resource units. Not only have we identified a second tier, but we're starting on a very self-conscious effort to develop third tier and fourth tier, but I'll, I'll uh, limit my discussion this evening to second tier. So let's look at the currently identified second tier variables. Um, so if we're going to then look at a resource system, what this is arguing is that you don't need nine variables every time you are thinking about different resource systems. But looking at the, these nine in terms of what kind of sector, the clarity of the boundaries, uh, the human constructed facilities, equilibrium properties, etc., help you say, well, what of those are very important for understanding this resource system? Um, similarly with governance systems, uh, some of them don't have any government organizations at all. Um, some of them don't have any non-governmental organizations. Uh, they uh, have very informal, no formal arrangements whatsoever. They probably do have a network structure if they don't have either government or private. Um, and then we look at their kind of uh, right systems, collective choice rules, constitutional rules, uh, and formal monitoring and sanctioning. So then we get down to the actors, um, and uh, we need to be looking at a number of questions about actors. How many are there? What kind of attributes do they have? What kind of history do they have? Have they lived in this area for a very long time? Do they know the resource extraordinarily well? Um, what kind of importance and dependence uh, do they have on it, et cetera. Uh, so that gives you the beginning. Sometimes people have a problem with resource units, uh, but for a person who studied groundwater for a very long time, um, uh, there you've got water that's pretty stable, and you pull it up and you can measure uh, how much you've pulled up. Um, if you are studying a fishery, your resource units move around uh, and are much more difficult to identify. And if you're studying an irrigation system, which is again water, uh, you have things moving downhill uh, so that uh, looking at the actual units and how they're organized makes a big difference. So to do good research, what you have to do is choose a question carefully. Um, Obviously, one question would be, when will the users of a common pool resource self-organize and harden uh, said never, basically. Um, and they were trapped and uh, couldn't. Uh, and so many policies of, uh, since 1968, when he wrote that article, published that article on science, um, have presumed that that was right 
and that governments must impose uniform solutions on all forests, all fisheries, and all water systems. Uh, there have been many failures, uh, some successes. Um, so and there, that part of our problem is that there's no system like a private or a public or a community that doesn't have a mixture of successes and failures. And what we're needing is to get in and diagnose why there are multiple. But what we want to understand is when will people uh, identify uh, and, and self-organize, and, um, and why will s uh, some of them survive and others collapse. And so uh, research has, over time, identified a, a variety of variables that are conducive to self-organization. Uh, for those of you who like mathematical models, uh, in the science article there is a, uh, a supplement uh, that uh, provides a, a mathematical foundation for that. But um, the, um, uh, basically, um, one way of capturing it in very short order is people will self-organize when they perceive the benefits of self-organization to be higher than the costs. Well, uh, that's a very nice thing to do in terms of stating it, but uh, measuring it is entirely di uh, different and difficult problem. Um, and so in the earlier thing, I starred a number of variables as affecting the probability of self-organization. Uh, I'm going to turn to two different cases um, uh, to illustrate this. Um, so the first one will be um, um, uh, a series of uh, fishing communities uh, along the coast of Mexico. Um, and... Um, with good field work, Javier Basurto, who is my co-author here, was able to really get good <coughs> data <coughs> on the um, fisheries, what kind of benefits, and what were the costs that local fishermen were paying. And um, there are three fishing villages along the coast uh, of, Cal of um, that's the Gulf of California, I was born uh, in Los Angeles, a little bit further above the um, uh, um, um, border between Mexico and the United States. Um, the um, area um, way, way high, um, uh, uh, which had a group of uh, fishermen uh, that were very, very important, uh, <coughs> uh, Panasco. Uh, and um, for a lot of the fishermen came in low into the system and would not get up there. And they were able to um, develop a system. Um, but we studied that and um, uh, the system of Kino and um, the uh, others. So deep end shells. Um, and these are very difficult when you go fishing for them you see a shell, like in the upper right-hand corner. Um, you don't see the mollusk. And the size of the mollusk and the size of the shell are not perfectly correlated. So a, a very knowledgeable fisherman gains a real skill in trying to determine uh, where slow and uh, medium size. Uh, there is local leadership in Seri and Penasco, but not in Kino. Uh, trust and reciprocity is lacking in Kino, uh, present in Penasco and Seri. Uh, shared local knowledge um, uh, is lacking in uh, Kino, uh, but exists in high levels in Penasco and Seri. <clears throat> Dependence on the resource is low, high, high. Um, technology, they all use the same, so there's no real difference uh, in the technology of use. The um, um, governance system, both Kino and Panasco did not have formal property system. Seri, as an indigenous community, had had the government of Mexico assign uh, a formal system to them. Um, that uh, meant that they had formal rights um, operational rules were present in almost all three at a pretty effective level. 
uh, were there in all three. Um, but the monitoring and sanctioning of what was going on was absent in Kino and present in Seri and Panasco. The resource system was large versus small and small. Uh, the uh, accuracy of the indicators uh, and the availability of them was uh, not very available under Kino and uh, moderately uh, or mostly available with Panasco and Seri. Um, and basically, uh, you could finish the, the rest of the table. Um, two of the SESs were organized. And I think as you look at that table, it's very obvious, if you'll flip back one, um, that um, uh, Panasco and Seri were similar on most fronts. So just run down that series. It's not perfectly similar, but the table gives us, uh, the SES framework gives us a way of identifying important similarities. Um, but Kino was entirely different. It was a very much larger system. Uh, it turned out it was a, a large commercial center, um, a very large number of people out fishing. They did not get to know one another very well. Um, uh, the productivity, uh, the indicators of that system were less in Kino. The predictability was less. Local leadership was absent. Trust and reciprocity were absent. So. People want to find a single variable. Uh, this is the variable. Well, that's rare that you ever find a single variable. Um, and um, um, uh, Kino Bay uh, was open access. And uh, that's an incredible lineup of, of boats um, uh, waiting to go out at any, any time. Um, and um, the, um, um, they, they had no rules about who could go out, when, where, and how. Um, so it was really a overfished, open access fishery. Um, Seri, on the other hand, um, uh, was um, uh, a, um, they developed uh, their own common property regime um, so that they developed a decision about who could fish at what time uh, and um, how many uh, mollusks they could capture. So what we have is looking at this is that two of the SESs had a chance of uh, having self-organized, of being robust over time. Um, but is self-organization sufficient and the answer has to be, unfortunately, no. Um, the reserve that was set up in Panasco was so successful, that was the one way high um, uh, in north in, on the coast, that other fishermen who had never been up there started coming up and fishing. Uh, and so the fishery they had protected from their own overuse, but they tried then to get the government and others to help them keep others out, and the government said, no, 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 you have your own property rights, but you can't keep others out. Uh, so having attracted fishers from a wide variety of sources, um, the, um, uh, they were able, they were overfished by others, and they finally said, heck, why should we be so conservative? Uh, let's go in and fish ourselves and, for, you know, forget it because they're going to ruin our fishery. So they did. Um, okay, so that gets us at um, robustness, and that was, um, Sharon mentioned, uh, governing the commons. Uh, in that book, I dealt with a variety of design principles, including boundaries between of those who are actors and the resource be clear, the congruence between benefits and costs. Uh, actors had procedures for making their own rules. Uh, regular monitoring of actors and resource conditions. Graduated sanctions, conflict resolutions, minimal recognition of rights by government, and nested or polycentric system. Um, and it is obvious that Aquino had very few of those. Um, uh, the uh, Seri fishery had almost all, 
uh, and uh, Podasco um, had pr uh, procedures for making their own rules, but they didn't have the bottom uh, design principles. Uh, they weren't recognized. So they could make rules, but that wasn't sufficient. Now, I'd like to move across the Atlantic to a country that you know and a community that you know, um, uh, uh, he moving here to Bangalore. I've been working with uh, Harini Najendra in using the SES uh, framework to understand why there are differences among the lakes in Bangalore. Um, as many of you know, in earlier times, uh, farmers uh, built those lakes as ponds for farming. Um, and uh, they had uh, developed their rules so that in 2,000 years ago, 1,500, 1,000 years ago, uh, they were well governed. But then you had the Brits come in, and uh, then they decided, uh, developed a system which was adopted uh, by uh, a variety of others. And um, so they lost that. Uh, for those of you who have not looked at the lake system, it's really incredible. Um, the number of lakes and their inner ties. Um, and um, the, um, if you were to then go and visit, uh, uh, if you go to, uh, now I'm afraid, Harini, can you say the name? Okay. Um, was a very polluted lake uh, until recently, but now it's been restored through collaboration. Then if we go to Varsar, uh, one of the larger lakes at the end of the lake chain, uh, but now heavily polluted with sewage as well as tux hospital um, uh, effluents. So when you have industrial waste and hospital waste, that is a very big problem. Uh, so then uh, let's go ahead and share the analysis that Harini and I have done. And uh, this is not final. Uh, we have a paper in uh, uh, almost final a draft. But if anybody has any suggestions for us, we will uh, be very appreciative. Um, oh, you may have a hard time <laughs> seeing that. Sorry. Um, the, um, uh, we have the seven legs across the top. Uh, and the variables uh, from the table uh, across the, down the uh, size. Um, and um, basically, um, if anybody wants to see a copy of that recent paper, we would be very happy to share it. Uh, what we have is that uh, we are, for dependent variables, we looked at uh, had they really engaged in collective action. So the, our first question was collective action, do they do it? And two, uh, did they then um, uh, help reduce the pollution in the lake? And two lakes were successful in uh, both of those outcome variables. One was rather small and one moderate, but they shared similar rankings on all other variables. Um, so that they uh, have been able to cope with pollution levels, uh, they were the only two to achieve high ecological performance ratings. Uh, they've learned how to network with government officials in such a way that uh, uh, they've been able to get uh, very substantial help um, and um, uh, uh, develop a real effective system. On the other hand, um, one of the interesting things about your uh, metropolitan area is that um, it takes a very substantial amount of organization on the part of local communities to get organized uh, and um, the level of pollution across lakes for the ones that are not successful yet uh, is very substantial um, and uh, so you, t for people who have to use groundwater, it can be a very, very substantial problem. Uh, and um, uh, many of you will observed protest movements, uh, maybe uh, wondered a bit about them. But if you live next to a lake that gets worse and worse and you can't get anyone active in doing something about it, uh, you move to protest. And so 
in some respects, uh, you have a system that is has allowed a fair amount of uh, initiative on the part of some of the lakes, but. Um, uh, it has not allowed a lot, and part of it is that you have um, very large lakes that have a very, very substantial problem of who, who in the government do they deal with, since there are so many government agencies involved. Um, uh, the responsibility for developing local rules, re, re practices, uh, has been organized by some neighborhood organizations. Uh, but they don't have, uh, it's pretty hard if you're a neighborhood organization to deal with industry uh, or hospitals or jails uh, uh, that are very substantial sources of pollution. And uh, as I've talked about polycentricity, which is having s large, medium, and small systems, it's not a panacea, but without it, uh, there are some problems that you just cannot solve. And uh, so uh, I hope I am hoping that uh, our paper, when it, it is final, um, uh, helps people uh, move toward a more polycentric system for this important area uh, that um, I'm very pleased that we were able to study. So uh, let me turn to questions, if there are any. Um, and um, the, um, I'm very glad to uh, answer. Uh, for a few minutes, because I think time is limited. But if there are questions. Thank you. Uh, we, we normally don't have questions oh, uh, in these okay. lectures, but I think we have already still have three more minutes. <laughs> There are any questions? Uh, I'm sure there are. Well, it might be oh, that you don't ask tonight, but um, uh, uh, Harini, I think you're willing to take them uh, over the next several weeks if some comes along. In the Mexico case, you uh, you have a more thorough uh, description of. Yeah. Yes. At the back. Us, listen to you. Can I ask you a question unrelated to your lecture presentation, but on the sustainability issue, it seems to some of us that it's a question of lifestyles at heart. And the problem is what Schumacher called the first class passengers on spaceship Earth. What would you say as regards the sustainability of the lifestyle in the developed world as a whole, we don't see, even after the economic crisis, a fundamental questioning of the sustainability of that lifestyle. All well, the effort seems to be to get back to business as usual. So a first-rate opportunity seems to have been lost. And I just like you have the voice it. to raise that question. No, everybody has the voice. That's a different thing. And, but what would you say about the sustainability? Well, I think Thank we're uh, running very severe risks. Um, but I, I don't see it as, you know, at the point that Hardin's uh, work was believed as the truth, <clears throat> then uh, people would raise the questions of, let's get organized, let's get in there and do something. Um, people would say, oh, that's foolish. At this point, I think we have evidence over <coughs> 20, 30 years from a variety of places that it's difficult, but not impossible. And so hopefully when we are teaching and uh, work with our students, uh, they learn about uh, success cases uh, in difficult uh, the um, um, fishery uh, case uh, is a difficult one um, in Mexico, um, but um, the um, uh, success um, of the um, Penasco fishermen 
uh, was rather rather amazing, uh, and uh, they are able to sustain it. What what's tragic is that an indigenous group like the Seri um, uh, have been uh, told that they are able to make rules about internal life, but they can't exclude anybody else from using their fishery. <coughs> so what we need is uh, uh, to have very strong sense that it can be done, but it needs government um, help from the perspective that in many instances, governments have said, no, you may not. Uh, uh, as the government of Mexico did to the Seri. No, you cannot enforce your own rules. Uh, and we, we've got to articulate with our government officials that uh, there are polycentric systems that involve uh, much higher levels of um, the green economy uh, over the long run and uh, that we're not going to be able to have a decent globe if we don't uh, open that up.